Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful, so very thankful for the opportunity that you've given us here in this particular format to feast upon your word together. I just ask that you would filter out all the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the book of Jude. For a fact, redemption, uh, the word there in the Greek is ex agorazo, uh, meaning to ransom, to purchase, to buy out. Like It would be like buying a slave out of slavery, except in our case, the price isn't money, but it's the blood of Christ. But that's what the word means. And salvation, soterios, meaning deliverance. Now these are two entirely different words. I've addressed this in past videos. They're not synonyms. They are absolutely not synonyms. Uh, just common sense tells us that uh, God's usage of the two words means that they, they don't mean the same thing. However, there are places in Scripture where we do see contained in the word salvation uh, deliverance, which includes redemption. Uh, a salvation that we all share in common in the sense of everything. From everything from redemption from the beginning to our final deliverance. Everything from Alpha to Omega. Everything from... God being uh, in Christ, being uh, Christ being the author and the finisher of our faith. It's a salvation that we all share in common. An all-encompassing salvation. And it all depends upon the context, which unfortunately many Christians ignore. Like if I told a, a trained athlete, who competes in foot races that I was going to run to the store and you know he might misinterpret what I meant because I'd probably drive my Jeep uh, especially at my age we read in Philippians chapter 2 work out your own salvation uh, I want you to take note of that. That which is particularly yours, if you, if you look at that in the original text, you'll see that that's not our common salvation that's talked about here in Jude. To work out our, our own salvation, the word there is our own salvation. That which is particularly yours doesn't sound common as we're reading here in Jude. So maybe the common salvation here isn't that daily experience of yours. In fact, the epistle ends with to present you in the presence of his glory without spot, without blemish. I have to believe that this common salvation or, the, or deliverance is related to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints, all saints. We soon realize in, in this book that this faith is contrasted with those uh, among us who are ungodly. So bear with me and I'll, I'll try and explain how I'm seeing uh, these passages here in Jude. We've just started out in this epistle. Now, I don't want to rush through it too quickly. I pointed out in part one how that the word common is in other places translated unclean, but you wouldn't want to say this is unclean salvation because it's, it's that salvation which is accomplished in Christ. I happen to think it looks backwards to our already being told that we are blameless in Christ, and it looks forward to where he says at the end of Jude that that we will be presented faultless in His presence with exceeding joy in the 24th verse. In the meantime, between the common salvation and the end of the letter, the Holy Spirit says 
it is absolutely mandatory that you be written to, exhorted, reminded to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. One of the common approaches to this is that this is talking about your personal faith and trust in Christ. So that's really what that means is, is the gospel as it's commonly preached today. Most of the commentaries say that the common salvation referred to here is the gospel. And, and so what Jude wants you to contend for is this common salvation. That, you know, that, it, that if we dot all the I's and cross all the T's, that, then we'll be saved, we'll be delivered. So that is what was once delivered to the saints. And as you may guess, I don't think that's what it says. But that's up to you. I believe the Holy Spirit is telling us that it's needful, it's important that we contend for the faith, articulated faith. That word contend is... is uh, all one word. It's one word. Its root word is our English word agony. It's a word used in the Greek uh, literature of those who agonize in sports. That word is, is used many times in the Greek language for athletic endeavors, which people really, really work at. It's a word which means to agonize over, to really, really contend for the faith. Now, if we are exhorted by God, not by Jude, it is God Almighty who's telling us that it's needful for us to really struggle, contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. You know, we read in Philippians to work out your own salvation. That doesn't sound common. You know, with fear and trembling, for it is God at work in you both the will and do of His good pleasure. Here we are exhorted to agonize, to work as we would in, in a, an athletic competition for the faith. Once delivered, the word means once for all. It means once, not again. It is the death knell of modern evangelism in my opinion. If they'd simply take the scriptures at face value, once in this third verse means that it's completely done. There isn't anything more to do. And what is that faith that was once delivered? In the ninth chapter of Hebrews, we are introduced to the fact that it's appointed unto men once to die. And then in the 10th chapter, we're told that these sacrifices, which are offered year by year, could in no way result in a, a loss of any consciousness of sin. But then we see one offering, and that's Christ. He was offered once for the sins of His people. The faith there, I believe, is the work of Christ, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Folks, I am personally persuaded, which, which puts me way out on the fringe, that most of the places that we see faith in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is talking about the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. If we go back to Galatians, verse 16 of chapter 2, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, any of you who have a modern translation, you know, it would say, by faith in Christ, and as I pointed out in the past, it's by the faith of Jesus Christ. We have a genitive there. So it's not our faith in Christ. It's not our objective faith in Christ, but it's the faithfulness of Christ. Now, most modern translations don't translate it that way because, you know, most people don't believe it's that way. Why then do we translate it in? Well, that's the normal perception. We have other verses of Scripture that indicate we ought to place our, our faith and trust in Christ. Of course we do, but that's not what this one, this one says. We know 
that law doesn't justify you, but Christ does. It isn't your faith in Christ that justifies you. It's the fact that Jesus Christ paid the price. Our Lord was once offered for sins. That's never going to happen again. In fact, if you study the epistle to the Hebrews, you'll see that the author, whoever that might happen to be, is addressing different classes of Jews. Christ is not coming again. Our Lord was once offered for sins. That's never going to happen again. And I believe that that's the idea here that we're looking at here in Jude. It was once delivered to the saints. Are you following me? The saints are God's people. They are the elect. And that's not unique to us, folks. God, God had elect in the Old Testament. He has elect today. He has an elect for the... For the 70th week of Daniel, he has elect for the kingdom age. There's no doubt God has elect from every age, and it's all based on what? The faithfulness of, of Jesus Christ. So I, I think that we are to contend for that. We are to agonize for that. Dearly beloved, please listen to me. We're in, we're in a very... Uh, interesting short book here and I am persuaded that the majority of those who are talking about Scripture are not contending for the faith as we see it written here in Jude and everywhere else in the New Testament and it is it's astounding what some of the people say and there's a good number of serious committed Christians who are supporting works that put out this kind of error. One of the things I could do is, is, is tell you, you know, everybody that's teaching error, you know, I can just sit down and make out, make out my list. You know, not that I know everybody, but the ones I know. But, but that doesn't help you a bit. It doesn't help you a bit to tell you that, that some Bible teacher alive today, maybe one that you like, is actually teaching error. If all I do is talk to you about error, you haven't learned any truth. So I haven't done anybody any good by listing names. God knows those who are His. And it, and it seems to me that our responsibility is to study this book, study His Word, and and not tell you that this person or that person is not teaching truth. Somebody I really respect spent two hours listing modern preachers who don't, who don't fit in this verse as far as they're concerned. And out of all of that, I didn't learn anything except for his list of names. If you know the truth, you are able to listen to somebody and say, well, man, that's not biblically true. And so I think our responsibility is to determine what this book says, and I am contending, okay, that you have a great responsibility to agonize over the validity of a very simple truth, and that is that God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, deigned to become your kinsman, redeemer, and died in your place. He didn't die in your place because you asked him to. He didn't die in your place because you were worth dying for. He died in your place because you were his. You were his from before the foundation of the world. And when he died in your place, you cannot die. And you're surrounded by Christians, even seminaries, who teach that some of you are really good and you know some of you are, are quite carnal you know you got the good Christians you got the really good Christians you got those that aren't that good and you got some that's really not good at all you know who don't even have the right to go to heaven and they divide Christians into various classes folks if Jesus Christ died in your place you cannot die that is a once-for-all offering for sin. That's our word, once delivered. Are you following me? 
If he didn't die in your place, you cannot live. It's that simple. That faith, folks, is not an exhortation for you to do something, but for us to teach what Jesus Christ has already done. That is what I'm contending. Okay? And I contend that the perfect, finished work of Christ and His faithfulness extends throughout our life in Him. He being the author and the finisher of our faith. Yet much of the so-called gospel today is a uh, your faith, your works, prosperity gospel. When the, when the gospel, the faith, is that Jesus Christ died in our place and we are redeemed. And we had no part in that. The faith, once delivered, is that Jesus paid it all. It's done. You don't have to worry about it. Oh, you're going to have to give an account for it. How, how much you love Him is the basis upon how much you will serve Him, not the basis upon you going to heaven. A stumbling block. Why is that? Because nobody wants that. People say, we go to heaven if we keep the law. We got to do things. We got to do stuff. We know that in the business world, in sports, in, in all aspects of life, those who do things, they're the ones who advance. They're the ones who succeed. And so the cross becomes a stumbling block. What did you do to go to heaven? Nothing. Nothing. You are God's child. Jesus Christ died once for sin. He was once offered. Hebrews 10, He perfected forever those whom He set apart. Did God set you apart? If you don't believe that, you don't believe Scripture. He's perfected you forever. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? That the excellence of the power might be of God and not of us. And too many want to make the Christian life the excellency being of us and not of God. We are the filth and the off-scouring of the world system. It was once delivered. It'll never change. It's not going to be delivered again. It's exactly what God decreed, and that is it. And when the Mormons say that, that well, there's an additional revelation, you know, through Joseph Smith, they are in direct contradiction of this verse of Scripture. You are not redeemed because you trust in Christ. You are not born again because you accepted Christ. All of the cl cliches of modern evangelism put the cart before the horse. The new creation accepted Christ. The unregenerate man could not. The new man trusts in Christ. The natural man could not. The new man believes in Christ. The natural man could not. Life came first. Why is it so hard for Christians today to understand that light comes before everything else? Everything was dark. God said, let there be light. Life comes first. First, and everything else springs forth from that life. It came before any response or any action on your part. And that is the faith that we are to contend for. That is what Jude is saying. I would bet my life on that. But don't believe this because I do. Don't just take my word for it. Folks, study the text. Look at it for yourself. Judge it in light of all of Scripture. Use the analogy of, of Scripture, the analogy of the faith. Compare verses. Build precept upon precept. Allow Scripture to look at and, and see the harmony that exists with all of the Word of God. There's no contradiction. No verse contradicts another. It all fits perfectly together. Why? Because God wrote it. God's the author, and He cannot lie. And we can trust Him. And 
above all else. But what he desires, I've said this before, I believe that what God desires of us more than anything is that we trust in him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. When all odds go against us, when we're standing alone, we trust him. And there's no one else around that agrees with us. We trust in him. And God puts us in those circumstances. Folks, you're not in these circumstances because of, you know, some construction of your own. Some some circumstance that came about as a as a result of you know uh, you folks you're not in these in these circumstances because of of a coincidence god has placed you in a position in which in which you've you have to we have to lean on him when it when everything it, in our life, it, when everything around us seems to be contrary to to what seems right, that's the stumbling block that that modern Christianity stumbles over: the cross. What Jesus accomplished on that cross for His people. You are redeemed because Jesus Christ purchased you. You are made righteous because He died in your place. You're reconciled because of His death. You live because of His life. It is Christ in Christ alone. He is the one who was once offered for us. I believe that to be the faith we're to contend for. And so this is our introduction into this book of Jude. This is the foundation that God is laying before we go forward, before He carries us on forward to the conclusion of this letter. It's not Christianity, it's Christ. For there are certain men who crept in unaware who were before ordained to this condemnation. They're creeping in unaware. It was... The word there is, it was, you see, it's, it was written beforehand. It was written before that they were ordained to this condemnation. I believe they're there by God's ordination. It is, it's interesting language. These men have crept in. They've come in unawares. And, and what we want to do is translate, you know, that, you know, that they snuck in. I, you know, I think the unawares is a comment from the Holy Spirit that ought to wake us up. How did they come in unawares? You mean we didn't recognize the error that they were bringing? Is it possible that these people came in and we didn't even recognize it? So maybe we're not earnestly contending for the faith. Maybe we really don't understand what we should have been doing. That these men crept in who were before ordained, of whom it was written before to this condemnation. I strongly suggest they came in unawares from the human standpoint because of those who were not contending for the faith once delivered. And, and I am absolutely persuaded that at this present time, just prior to our Lord's return, at this late, late a period in, in, in the history of the, of the church, those who have contended for the faith would be regarded as those who crept in unawares. A total reverse. I want you to spend time in this book to know what the faith is. The text says that these ones came in unawares and they're ordained to this condemnation. They are ungodly. The text makes it absolutely crystal clear these are ungodly men. They've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness the grace of god they didn't turn the law of god into licentiousness or they turned the grace of god into lasciviousness the normal approach to the next few verses that we'll be looking at in the days to come is that these people are you know i'm telling you this is the normal approach is that these people are there are 
they're erotic and sensual and all they do, everything that they do is related to sexual immorality. And I'm not in any way suggesting that maybe that there's not an element of that in those verses that we'll be looking at ahead. But what we call contrary to our convictions of modesty and honesty and, and purity, what we would call erotic and, and sexual and, and pornographic, in the same way God speaks in similar language of that which is doctrinally impure. There's also what the Holy Spirit calls spiritual fornication, spiritual adultery. Prostitution can be physical prostitution, but many times God speaks of it as a prostitution from the truth of His Word. So when we get to lasciviousness, I can preach through, you know, these, these, uh, well, I can preach through three to four videos on how, uh, how the girls dress in modern churches and how men act and, you know, and almost every commentary I've looked at speaks of, of a sexual orientation of the next few verses. What I believe we're going to see, along with other things, are the two extremes, legalism and licentiousness. Well, I'm out of time. First Peter 5.10 But may the God of all grace who called us to His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.